Transitioning is a big part of international teaching. It is also one of the themes of our information hub and podcast. We speak with experts while also learning from educators about their experiences moving from country to country. With this said, we realize that we have a couple of super veterans in the Educators Going Global community who just made another transition to continue their 30 plus years of teaching and living internationally. I'm speaking about my co-host Audrey and her husband Mark, who now find themselves overseas after just one year of so-called retirement in their home country. I also guess that this is another of our Where in the World Are They episodes. We will have a reveal at the end of the interview. Our guiding question for this episode was, what are some tried and true ways to prepare to transition to a new school and country? Audrey and Mark share valuable insights from years of moves covering topics such as finances, both in one's home country and new country, documentation to-dos, packing, what goes and what stays, social factors, emotional experiences, and orientation, school provided and doing one's own. A bonus for this episode is that you get to spend extra time with Audrey getting to hear her wisdom even more than usual. The double bonus for me was getting to experience Mark's analytical and focused mind once again. Mark is a legend in international education for his teaching and community building through coaching, athletic league formation, and umpiring. This show was recorded on October 18, 2024. I now have the pleasure of bringing you two extraordinary friends and educators. Audrey and Mark Forgeron. Hello and welcome to the Educators Going Global podcast. And I'm welcoming our listeners big time because we have two familiar guests. One is Audrey Forgeron. And you've often heard us speak about her husband, Mark. So this is a very special show where we're going to have the two of them being interviewed by me. I'm super psyched because they're such great buddies. And I was just off air with Mark. And it was like we picked up from 30 years ago when we worked together. And he was teasing me a little bit, but I handled it. No problem. So Audrey and Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks, Garp. It's been a long time. Good to see you again. Thank you there, buddy. So like I said, I'm going to be the man behind the hosting mic and do my best It's going to be a little difficult without my excellent partner. So we'll see how it goes. So let's get started with some going global stories and trying to connect to our guiding question. So Audrey, why don't you start us with your going global story? Well, since this is about transitions, I thought I'd share a few of the different transition processes that we've gone through over the years. My first school was in Ethiopia, and this was 30 years ago, mind you. Started off, I asked for the name of the person I was replacing, who was a French teacher. I sent a letter and said, what materials are there there? And he wrote back and said, there's basically nothing. Good luck. (laughs) And thank goodness that later I got a letter from the wonderful Amy Hunt, who sent it to every new teacher and gave us a whole lot more detail and was very kind and really put me at ease. So, you know, that was not the easiest transition. Second school we went to in Saudi, David and I were there together. We had two couples assigned to us as buddies. They called us in the summertime. They arrived ahead of us. They set up our house because the housing was provided. And, you know, they gave you a startup pack with like dishes, pots and pans. They put those in the dishwasher, washed them up. They washed the uh, sheets and put them on the bed for us. Like it was just, it was incredible. It was like coming to a hotel. It was insane. And then they were always available if we needed help. Third school. In Singapore, there was a couple, the Millers, wonderful people, and they were in charge of all orientation. And we went two weeks early. They took us around town. We visited different teacher housing to get a sense of what it was like. And then they connected us with a realtor to help get us started. And we did a bunch of different 
outings and activities as teachers, and it was super fun, and we really felt welcome there. Fourth school was Chile. The school rented a place for us there, but we had some say in where we wanted to be. They provided phones for us, which was awesome, and they loaded us up with the numbers we might need, and they provided local language classes, so that was pretty cool. Our fifth school was Senegal, and the housing was again provided with some choice whether you want to be near school or further away. Uh, and they offered several outings for us newbies, which was great. Our sixth school in Rome, the PR person was in charge of the orientation and she created a WhatsApp group and we were all on it and shared a lot of information. We went to restaurants and a couple of different outings as well. And housing was not provided. We had to find our own, but we could, you know, we got advice on it. And our seventh school, Jamaica, we lived in a gated community. We, again, had some say in where we wanted to stay, which was nice. There was, again, a WhatsApp group. We did some beach trips, some restaurants, and, you know, just some nice general orientation. And in fact, I'm still on that WhatsApp group because it's just fun to keep up with the new people and see what's going on. And then in our current school, housing was provided and there's an onboarding team of two veteran teachers and What's really been cool here is that the onboarding has continued. In fact, today we were just out on a little outing organized by the onboarding teachers, and that's really nice. And again, there's a WhatsApp group, and they actually provided, they made a map. You know, you can make your own Google map and label places and stuff. And so they made a map of all the interesting places in our current city. So all kinds of different orientation approaches. And, you know, we've sometimes felt more educated about our new place and sometimes a bit less. But just to explain to everybody that it's always different and it's always interesting to see what they do. What a nice snapshot for our listeners. Uh, And and we're going to go in depth with this episode. So there you go. All right, Mark, let's hear your going global story. Well, I'm going to backtrack a little bit from before Audrey and I met because I actually had my first overseas job in 1984. I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and that was zero onboarding, really. (laughs) You flew in, and they said, okay, uh, we're going to give you a little bit of language time, and then they drop you off in a village, and okay, good luck. (laughs) The school I'm at now is actually my 10th school and my ninth country to work in, and this one, it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. When you've been an international teacher for a while, you meet a lot of people and then people come and go like you have in our lives and you connect with them again over and over again. And I've been a middle school teacher for 40 years now. Many colleagues that I had decided somewhere during their career, they were going to go the admin route and become an administrator, right? So people that were my colleagues in a middle school are now principals of schools and heads of schools. And so you can network a lot. So quite honestly, David, the last... I don't know, four or five jobs we've barely recruited for because we know enough people and they even contact us before I contact them, right? So the current job I'm in, after we finished in Jamaica, that was two years ago, I said, I think I'm retiring now. I'm already in my 60s, so I'm going to retire now. And so we went back to our home in Vermont and I was not working and I just done a few jobs here and there, helping out of school and doing some things, but I was pretty sure I was retired. I did keep open my search associates membership just in case I was tempted or what might be interesting out there. But I wasn't really looking. So I'm retired and it's January or February and the school I'm at now posts a job. And so I wrote to the headmaster, who is a colleague from 20 years ago. And I said to her, I'm not applying for your job. I'm retired now. But if come May, you don't find someone, I'd be happy to do a one-year job for you because it might be interesting and I'm happy to fill a need. And We're friends and colleagues and that can work. Less than 24 hours, I was getting contacted from her and her principal to say, we want to talk, we want to talk. Okay, so again, it was just, they really wanted me to come there. They made it very clear they wanted me to come there. They knew of my work from before. When I was intrigued by the school, you know, Audrey and I said, well, we have friends that used to teach in that school. We had one that was currently there, we're going to be leaving. We had others that had been there before. We had another one that we worked with in Ethiopia and in Singapore, and he's currently in this school now. So we've been together in three schools now. So we had a lot of people we could talk to about what is it really like there? I'm just not going to look at a website or a search associates page. I'm going to talk to friends that just left there or that are currently there to get the real lowdown to see if they think it's a good fit for me. 
So between being recruited by a friend that was now the head of the school and friends that had been there or are currently here, it made the decision very easy because I knew exactly what we're going to go into. And if I thought this would be a good fit for me and because they knew me, they'd be able to say, you're going to love this about it. Just so you know, this might be a bit of a challenge, so you might want to think about that. Just so you know, coming in, you're making decision, but be aware of this. And so kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of going into Peace Corps of, we're going to send you to West Africa and drop you off in a village. This was, oh, okay, so I know the headmaster. I know people in the school. I've done this for so many years. If they say they're doing this curriculum or they're doing AP or IB or Common Core, whatever they're doing, I've been there, done that. I've got so much experience now that I was so far on the other end of the spectrum of being prepared for a new job. And so it was just interesting how different it is now when I'm at the end of my career, how much I can network and how many people we know that can give us some very good intel about a place because they've been boots on the ground, so to speak. So I'm thinking of our veteran listeners who are just nodding their head when this is going out and people are listening to it. And they're just going, yep, that's how it works. And I think for our new people coming into international education, they're all also going, okay, hopefully at some point I'm going to get to that point. I'm going to be so networked. I'm going to have so much experience. And then the other side that kind of jumps out at me, it just feels good. You know, you two are such pros. You're the one that got the job. But Audrey is the trailing spouse. Uh, So many educators, specifically at that school, they know what she can bring to a school as a sub, someone who could step in and start a new program. And that's the great feeling. So thanks for sharing that. Let's move on to our guiding question, which our listeners can guess is, what are some tried and true ways to prepare to transition to a new school and country. And right off the bat, you're already hearing so many important strategies and just how it can go. And in this day and age, uh, there's so much information out there. And hopefully this episode will give you even more in how to transition. All right. So when we put the show together, we looked at some categories in the transitioning process. And the first one that kind of jumps out is finances. And we're going to look at this one from finances in your home country. If you're leaving your home country, maybe not so much it would come into play if you're just moving from one foreign country to another. But in this case, we're going to look at you two leaving the U.S. and moving to your new country. So, Mark, what were some financial things that you all had to put together to think about as you did your own transition to your new country? Well, David, the one thing about being you know older and more experienced, you probably don't have bills to pay for your children for university. You probably don't have a big mortgage to pay. So for us, it was more, okay, we've been setting aside money for quite a while for retirement and we're getting closer to that. So we only looked at financially, is this job going to be break even uh, in terms of can we travel enough and make a little bit? We didn't need to make new money for it. We're not 30 years old looking at our future investing money. We don't have a mortgage to pay, those kind of things. So it was more of, okay, we're looking for a position that will pay us enough that we won't be dipping into any savings by any means. Maybe we add to it a bit, but that wasn't so critical because we felt we're okay on that end. We want a good experience where we can live okay and travel well. And so would it cover those needs? And that's really been the case for the last couple. Even the school I'm in now, because there's no tax and because it's paid a little bit more, we're financially better off than we were in both Italy and Jamaica, right? So we may end up even saving a little bit, but that really wasn't the factor because we don't have some of those U.S. expenses you're worried about. So as long as we knew we could break even and and save a little bit, that's okay, but do all the travel that we want to do, that was critical. And we have, I mean, when we look at just in September, we travel back to the U.S. for a weekend for my parents' 65th anniversary, and next month, uh, Audrey's parents are going to come visit us and they're going to travel around a bit and we're helping them with their flights. So the key was, do we have enough money to do what we want to do in terms of quality of life? And I guess the other financial piece was, how's the health care going to be? In the U.S., because we're sort of retired, Vermont's a very good state that way. And so we had a lot of free health care in Vermont because that's what the state does when you're older and not making an income, even if you're not at full retirement yet. So we were doing okay in terms of coverage for healthcare. So we're looking at a school, we want to make sure we're getting decent healthcare and very global healthcare because we're going to lose the Vermont healthcare as soon as we sign a contract. So are we going to get something? And when we're in Italy, it was only healthcare in Italy. You had nothing when you went home in the summer because you were in the national program. And it was a good Italian national program, but you didn't have anything for the summer. 
Whereas, okay, so we found a school that was going to give us worldwide very good health care. And that meets financial goals too. And there's no deductible and they're paying for a lot of things and it's going to cover you in the summer. So you're not paying out of pocket for things. So I think between what money did we need for the quality of life we're looking for, which is mostly about travel and is our health care going to be covered? And if it is, that was an important decision of what we were looking for. I'm so happy you brought up that perspective of towards the end of your career. And I suspect that was part of your thinking when going to Rome and Jamaica. You had invested, you had saved for the future, and you could go to schools not making as much. But you bring up a very good point about the health care, the insurance. And we have blog posts about this in comparing schools. More and more schools are doing health insurance just in country. And so as Mark's saying, to find a school that has global health insurance is a biggie. And the idea that you have limited deductibility, that's huge too. So keep that in mind. And we've got two or three articles on this topic on the website. So keep that in mind. So Audrey, Mark's covered kind of the big, more global aspect of this. Could you cover some more of the kind of basic to-dos about what you need to be able to do financially, just to be in a foreign country, to have credit cards, to access an ATM or things like that? Well, as far as ATMs, most of the time we haven't ended up having a local bank account. It's different in every place. And we've been able to either get cash from the school or sometimes visit an ATM and get money out. We've typically had the option of having part of our pay in local currency and part of it in U.S. dollars, you know, often wired straight to our bank, which is awesome. And so, you know, the local currency that we use is usually the lesser amount of what we're doing and the larger amount is sent back in U.S. dollars and then we just access it if we need it. Usually, as far as a phone, I usually get a local plan and then use WhatsApp for my calls. And if I need a one-time password, I pop my US SIM in. As far as property, we intentionally bought a house in the US because we wanted the kids to have a place that they could say they were from. And interestingly, our son, when he went to university, said, yes, I'm from Vermont. And our daughter said, I'm an international kid. So they just had very different perspectives about that. But We've been able to store our stuff in the house because we have a big attic and garage and basement and, and a barn. So we've got, I mean, one day we're going to have to go back there and kind of call it down. But for now, we've had plenty of options to store and we've rented it furnished. So that's worked out really well for us. So generally, we've been able to kind of work it out so that we keep our U.S. stuff and use some local stuff, but it hasn't been that big a deal. Right. And you're just so used to this. With the ATMs, I think we've mentioned one time on one of our financial shows, if you have a Schwab brokerage and bank account, their ATM card will pay for any ATM transaction fees. So that's another plus. If you want to just try to use your U.S. bank account is, you know, a lot of a lot of countries you do set up your own bank account. And the third thing that we've talked about previously is having a credit card from your home country that doesn't charge a fee when you're overseas, no transaction fees. So those are just some things in our modern world that really help with this process. So thanks for sharing that. And like I said, we've got some articles, some blog posts up on the site so folks can take a look for a little bit more on the finances side of things. All right, so let's move into documentation, which we've talked about previously with some of our newbies going overseas to get forms, college transcript, things like that, that often the local government will want. So let's look at what you all experienced with this latest move regarding documentation, whether in any legal work that you had to do in one's home country, like you all are renting out your house. Was there anything special you had to do? So let's keep that in mind. Audrey, why don't we go with you on this one to start us off? So most places, this has been quite a process. Usually the school will help out with the paperwork, visas, and give advice on where to go and how to do that. But it is something that you should start early. If you're new to international education, 
first thing, as soon as you're even thinking about going recruiting is make sure your passport is up to date and has several years of validity left on it, because that's going to be a thing almost no matter where you go, they're going to want a year or a couple of years or at least a few months validity left on it. So that's number one, because that can take a lot of time, especially during COVID. It was like six months to get your passport renewed or some craziness. But generally, there's quite a lot to do. Luckily for me, Mark is very good at this stuff. So I'm going to hand it over to him to give more details on the paperwork aspect. Well, our current job is not much different from some of the others that schools try to get things going right away. So even before you're applying, as Audrey mentioned about passports, you should also make sure you know how to get a copy of your college transcript because they often ask for that. You might need an extra copy of your birth certificate. Sometimes it'll just take a scan. Sometimes they want an original with a seal. (laughs) So it can be all over the place. Countries like Italy, everything had to be certified. Chile was the same. These apostilates you had to have on there. And so you had to send things from your originals to an embassy to get things confirmed and sealed and then back to the other embassy. And things can take a long time. I remember going to Jamaica that we were waiting months to get certain things. And I actually called the Jamaican consul (laughs) in New York City just to ask for him to intervene and help me because I was waiting so long to get things going. And he was very helpful in the the process did speed up after that. But as an individual, I shouldn't have to be calling a consulate on my own to say, hey, can you help me process this? But I was for Jamaica, had to do that. In addition, we brought our small dog to Jamaica and there was so much paperwork for that that Audrey came a month after I did because we couldn't get everything done in time. So as soon as you, even if you're not even accepting a job yet, if you're considering it, you got to start, okay, do I have originals of these documents, especially college transcripts and things like that, birth certificate, because if they might need them. The current school, they didn't need anything official from a university. They just needed copies of a transcript and copies of birth certificate. So I could send in scans that I've made in PDFs and that was okay. So you always want to have that. You need to make sure before you start the process that you have scans of all your important documents, because if they just need that, you can send it off right away. And this stuff takes a long time. We're now the middle of October. We still do not have our work visa for our current country. And number one, when they we came in, they said, get a tourist visa. Ours expired, so we're on the second one. And if we don't get the work visa soon, they're going to have to renew it again. And that causes a problem when you renew it as a tourist th- three times in a row. But the school's going to help us with that. It also had a sad financial effect where in a lot of countries, if you have the work visa, you get discounted prices on things because you're a resident, right? And so We just had a holiday and we did a domestic flight that we're expecting to have the local rate because we'd be residents. But because our work visa has not been processed, the travel agent thought it had been. So at the airport, we were showing the tickets and the ticket people said, well, no, you you paid the wrong fare. You, You have to pay twice as much because you're a tourist. We said, but we live here, work here. We have for almost two months. They said, that's not in your passport. We don't see a work visa. So some of these things can take a long time. Even though we did start them early, it's still, it's a long process sometimes. So if you can be ready ahead of time with scans of everything and knowing how to get original copies of certain documentation. So as soon as you get the job, they're going to say, okay, we need copies of this. Do it right away. Do it immediately. I remember in Rome going down to the bureau I had to go to to get some stamps and get things FedExed out of there. And sometimes the school will pay for these FedEx, sometimes they won't. But still, you got to do it right away because then you wait way too long. And then sometimes you can't even get in the country. We're fortunate that our country lets you come in as a tourist and until they process your work visa. Other countries, you might have to have your work visa before you get there. That's what Jamaica was. That's why it was so stressful because I wasn't getting in if I didn't have the certain visa in my passport. So uh, it's, again, a lot of pre-planning can help make that work. You can't control the bureaucracy and slowness of a country, but you can get everything to your new school as quickly as possible to give them more time to process this. I really appreciate that veteran experience besides getting started right away that you said, hey, I've got to reach out to someone for help on this one. You just can't be passive. I guess that's the way I would describe it. And you work with the HR people. And of course, we're teachers. We're always courteous, but sometimes we have to push a little bit. And the idea that maybe you seek someone in the system, in the government of where you're going, probably isn't a bad idea. 
I'm hoping, fingers crossed, things are going to work out for you all very soon because I know you want to jump on some planes and do some traveling for sure. All right, let's look at personal items. And as we get older and travel around the world, we collect things, bring them back to our home country. And then the question is, what do we take with us to our next country? So there we're looking at just other types of paperwork, maybe vaccinations that you might need to bring. Uh, what clothes are you going to take? What is your shipping allowance? Can you bring a little furniture? One of the big things is to try to personalize your new home with what your limits and what you can bring. If you have artwork that you want to bring, if you're a musician, what musical items that you could bring with you. And then you're also dealing with storage. So Mark, why don't you take a stab at this one? I think over the years, not only have we downsized in terms of amount of stuff, I think we've kind of even downsized what we think we need to be overseas. Again, this is my 10th school, so the perspective has always kind of been narrowed in some ways. You are right that often what we decide to keep or bring with us depends on what the school is going to pay for and the shipping allowance. And if when we left Singapore, they gave us a lot of money, so we shipped everything home. When we left Italy, they gave us far less, and we just said, okay, well, there's an organization called Send My Bag, and you can send eight, ten suitcases, and it's basically unaccompanied baggage, and it's a little bit less money than if you paid for the bags to go with you. And when you get that third or fourth bag, they're always $150 or whatever they are. But then you have, when you land somewhere, then you got 10 bags and how are you going to get them home? Whereas a place like Send My Bag, which is global, there's other organizations like that. I'm not promoting them either. But in Italy, we just said, all right, well, we have all these extra bags. So we'll just have them pick it up at our house. It goes as unaccompanied luggage. You do it a couple of days before you're going to leave. It's going to arrive a few days after you get back to the U.S. and it's going to come to your house. So it's like you're getting your extra baggage, but you don't need a big van to get your stuff home because the stuff's being brought to you in a truck when you get to your house. So we've done things like that. And even now in our most recent school, they didn't give us much baggage allowance at all. They gave us a settle in and you had to pay for whatever you want. So if you wanted to bring 10 suitcases, you could, but you're going to pay for all that. They just gave you a settle in that's going to cover getting yourself there and then setting up your house when you get there. And we've got to the point of, well, okay, what do we really need? What do we really need? Do we need to bring a lot of artifacts and knickknacks and decorations? No, not so much, because we've decorated our house back in the States. So we're going to bring minimal things, because we're just transporting, and we can get some local things and just accept the house we have. Do we really need to bring certain things we like from the U.S., or can we can make do with what we find? And again, we've gotten a little bit more along those lines of, okay, yeah, it'd be great to have this particular product that I like, but I'll just see what they have when they get there. I'll find something that's close enough. So we find ourselves bringing less and less and less. So this year we came, we each came with two suitcases and then, but we had planned to bring four each, but okay. So to make it work, we can get two free on the flight. So we'll go with two free. We were going back to the U S a month later for my parents' anniversary. We had the bags ready to go at my son's house. So then I come back with two more for free. So we didn't spend any of our settling allowance on shipping because we figured we only need probably four suitcases each. If we're making two trips, we can get all those bags for free. Then the settling can be for other things, you know, that we wanted to get when we got here to make our house nice, or you just use the extra for your first months of spending and stuff, right? So we've been able to downsize quite a bit. One essential for me, though, in all the places we've been, I was counting up and I've worked in 10 schools globally, and I have either walked or mostly ridden a bike to seven of them. So I'm not a get a car guy. I'm just, I want to bike to it. And so most places we've been, if they gave us some housing options, we tried to get within, you know, three or four miles of school, five, six, seven kilometers so I can bike. That's the case in our current place. So I brought my bike with me. So that was one of my extra pieces of luggage that I did pay for because I knew that's my transport to school, right? And that saves a lot of hassle because there's no housing at our current place that's within walking distance, neither in Jamaica or Rome really either, sort of, but not really. So you had to work on, are we going to get a car? Are you going to get taxis? Are you going to use public transportation? What are you going to do? Now, this school here, nearly everyone comes to school by bus and van provided by the school. And so teachers, when they're done the school day, they're waiting for their colleagues to get there and they're dropping off one by one. I'm going home by bicycle when I want to, and it takes me 15 minutes. So it's a massive time saver. And I like being out on my bike, as you know. So that was an essential for me to bring because I know that's my transportation. It wasn't so much a, a luxury thing. And I could have got a bike here for sure, but 
why would I do that when I already have two bicycles? One's always been in my U.S. house and one's been in my overseas place. So the one that makes the most sense, I'm going to bring with me. And that's what I did. So I think we've needed less things because we tend to decorate less and say we're living for the experience and not to have a pretty home we're trying to show off. We don't need to decorate it as much because our U.S. house is that way. And we're going to be spending our time doing things where we're going. So as long as we have a decent place and we can see we get there. We did have the luxury of going home in September, but a lot of times people will go home for Christmas. And that way, oh, I really don't like the quality of sheets. I can bring back some sheets from the U.S. There's always those kind of options if you want to. But I think we've been a little bit less particular over the years about what do we really need to make this work? Let's bring a bit less. And to be honest with you, my four suitcases, one was full of stuff for Halloween costumes and Christmas. So that was one of my suitcases. (laughs) And the other was just... We're not sure what's happening for winter, but if we go back to the States, it's really cold. So we got to make sure we have lots of winter clothes with us, not at someone's house. So we have it for arriving somewhere in winter. So of my four suitcases, two were actually stuff I might not even need. It's just kind of fun stuff and possible winter stuff. So really, I didn't bring that much of what I what I actually need. Yes, and I can share the, the same feeling towards the end of my career. And I really appreciate you brought up the transportation. We've talked about that on some of the shows to f- try to find the, a way that you don't have to buy a car, if at all possible. And for some people, they might just say, you know, I really want a car because I want to travel in the countryside. It might be very accessible. So Mark, as the math teacher, I think you've got a, a math word problem right there. I'm leaving country A and going to country B, and I need to have four suitcases transported. How do I do that, especially if I'm going to return to my home country in a couple of months? I bet your kids could figure that one out. So that's a little tip from Dave on doing a math word problem. Audrey, how about you? Well, Mark said a lot of it, but I wanted to say that the amount of stuff we brought with us has varied over time. Before kids, we had less stuff. And then with kids, we started to accumulate more. And my feeling was always that the kids would want their stuff with them so that help them feel at home. And quite frankly, it was the same for me. I always liked having my own decorations around me and so on. It just helped me to feel comfortable. We used to bring furniture with us and we did all our shipments by sea. And part of the reason was that our schools we were at paid a good shipping allowance, like Mark mentioned. I had a considerable mass collection that came with us everywhere. I also used to drag my x-rays and medical papers around, but now I have scans of everything, so I don't have to do that anymore. I've pared back since the kids went off to university and the last three schools we've been to I've brought minimal artwork and no furniture at all. So like Mark said, we've been able to travel with just suitcases. I think it's pretty individual though, because you know we've known folks who arrive with just one suitcase and left with one suitcase. And I'm in awe of those people because that's not me. I'm the high maintenance traveler, but you know, it depends so much on your personality and what the school is offering. You know, if you have an unfurnished place, like in Chile, (laughs) unfurnished meant they even stripped out the light fixtures and things. There was no fridge, no appliances, nothing. And so, you know, we really had to buy a lot of the stuff. So then either you're going to sell all of that when you leave or you're going to take it with you. So it really so much depends on the place and the personality of the people. Yeah, and that brings up a great point to have that question ready on What does furnished mean when you're talking to the HR people and getting down to specifics? Does that mean it has a refrigerator? Does that mean it has air conditioning, et cetera, et cetera? I remember in Panama, furniture was so expensive and we found a guy up in the mountains who made furniture. So we had all this handcrafted furniture made. So there are a lot of different angles on how you can approach this topic of moving from one place to another. And then just as you're saying, what stage of life are you in, especially with having children and helping them with that whole transition process, as you said, that they have certain things that give them security and make them feel at home wherever they go. All right, let's move to social, which is a big topic for international education, staying connected to our loved ones, our friends, You probably already have your social networking, your WhatsApp going with family and friends, even if you've moved back to your home country for a while. But let's look into this a little bit 
once you've moved overseas, how are you going to connect locally and how are you going to stay connected to your friends, in your case, around the world, uh, not just back in your home country? Let's start with the first step of people in your new school. So you're, you're working with HR. You might be part of a WhatsApp group. What are ways that you can start connecting right off the bat to know what the new school will be like, potentially what the local culture will be like? And then maybe we can look a little bit back into what it would be like to stay connected to family back in your home country. Audrey, why don't you start us off on this one? Well, for me, I love meeting people. So during the orientation process, during those first startup meetings at school, you know, luncheons or large PD presentations or just big school meetings, gatherings, I'm always wanting to meet as many people as I can and really try to figure out who's who and where they belong. And so for me, it's more just making that effort and taking the time to try to get to know people. And I think it's helpful if you can look at ways outside of your classroom to be part of either different curricular committees or different after school groups. And those are other ways that you can get to know people and the school community. Things like student council or helping out at the dance or being part of the ecological group that collects the cans for recycling or, you know, whatever it is that you're into, I would say, try to get a little bit out of your own classroom and do what you can to join in on those kind of groups. It's been different being a trailing spouse because I wasn't directly part of orientation. I could have been. I, I came a little later than Mark, so I missed a few of the orientation, but they did include the trailing spouses. So that was nice. And so I've gotten to know a few of the people, but it's just different when you're not seeing them at school every day. We did recently do a trip with some of the mostly new people, and that was really fun. We did a hiking trip and got to know a lot of those people. And I would say that this school has done a really good job of giving us the opportunity to get to know each other. Uh, and then Mark set up some uh, outings with the non-teaching spouses. So that was really fun. And we have a little WhatsApp group there as well. I don't do a great job of Facebook and blogs. I don't post a lot. I really admire people who do. I'm just not one of them. As far as staying in touch with my family, we connect over Zoom multiple times per week and also over WhatsApp. And I also connect with friends a lot over WhatsApp. And LinkedIn has also increasingly become a place where I stay in touch with people. So I do have a few social media that I am into, uh, just not, not so much Facebook and not Instagram hardly at all. More I'm a lurker than a than a poster. Yeah. When I'm coming to a new place, as far as, you know, looking at the culture and things, I always start by trying to learn some of the new language. I think that's so important. And we've had other guests talk about that. So I'm right in that same camp where local people so appreciate the effort. You know, it just makes them feel validated and they enjoy often teaching you, you know, it was interesting in Senegal because I already spoke French and a lot of those people speak French, but they also wanted me to learn Wolof, which was the kind of the local, the largest group of people there with the had, spoke Wolof. So they were always teasing me about learning Wolof. So I, I made an effort there. But, you know, Duolingo, there are apps out there that can help you to learn some of the language. YouTube is a great resource too for language and also for culture. I usually get on and try to watch and find out, you know, what's this place like? What's it, you know, what's going on in that country so that I can get a bit of an idea because as we've said multiple times, it's kind of a leap of faith. You're moving to a place where you often have not been and don't really necessarily know a lot about it. Sometimes you have to look it up on the map and that's pretty cool. It's exciting for the adventure. And with what we've got on the internet, you can research as much as you want and try to find out a lot about the local culture and the country that you're going to be in before you even get there. So 
I think it's a really good idea to do that. We're always saying, do your research. Exactly. And I'll add a couple of things I've observed about your family in the way that you all stay connected, like you all were living in Vermont and you've got parents living in different places, is that you set up structured times online, whether you're working out, whether you're playing games. It's so cool for me to observe the way that you keep your family ties so strong. So now you're overseas, you're dealing with the timing and all that. So that's part of it too, but I'm sure you will keep going in that way. Mark, why don't we make this, because you're the one in the school, why don't we move this part of the discussion towards orientation into the school about what your experiences in general are with orientation and then maybe What I'm appreciating about what you share is you look at a situation and you go, okay, that looks reasonable, but maybe I can do this additional thing about it. So kind of that self-orientation. So could you tackle this one? Yeah, sure. I think we've been in schools that often it seems to be one or the other for orientation. One, they either have someone currently in the school that's going to be your colleague in your department, something, contact you and start a dialogue with you so you're getting to know someone in the school. Or they get you connected with the new teachers that are coming in. It seems that a lot of schools don't do both those things, and some do neither. But the last few schools we've had have done one or the other. So this school really got us in contact with the rest of the group coming in new with you, and not so much with people there. Now, fortunately, we knew someone here that was going to be leaving, so we had a lot of dialogue with him about the school to get ourselves oriented, so making the effort ourselves. But because we knew someone here, we could do that. But I found schools to be kind of different. They're almost on different ends of that spectrum of how do they want to get you to know about the school, to get to know the people you're coming in with so you're on the same boat together when it's new, or to get you brought up to speed with people that are already in the school to see what's happening. So this school did not give me much about what's happening here before I came in. But again, the perspective of a lot of experience is just that. You're older, but it's more perspective. So when you come in and they say, oh, by the way, we use Google Classroom, or we use you know, this, or we use that, different platforms, the chances are you've used one of those because you've been in a bunch of schools. You know, So when they come and say, we use Atlas, or we don't use Atlas, we use, we're a Common Core school, we're an IB school, we're an AP school. Again, if you've done this enough times, you have experience in all those venues. So whatever platform they're doing, you don't feel that intimidated by it. I find this school to throw a lot of stuff at you quickly and expect you to know about it. And so we do have one of our new colleagues that's middle-aged, but his first overseas job. And another colleague that's younger, like low 30s, but has been in a few places. And so both of them have had a bit of trouble transitioning because of all the stuff thrown at them. They don't have the background to absorb all this and know they can handle it. So I find this school assumes you know what you're doing and going to do all the things the way they want you to do it without directly telling you that. So there's, Audrey's right. There's been some great orientation for social things about you know meeting the new people and seeing things in town and getting out to do this and where are the nice stores and all these things. But in terms of school function, again, I'm on one end of the spectrum having seen and done so many things that chances are there's not a lot of new things coming my way. I've seen a version of what we're doing somewhere. But for some of my colleagues, that's not true, and they feel a bit overwhelmed at times. But when schools start up, I mean, unless you have, you know, like Singapore American School used to do, bring you in two and a half weeks early and give you lots of days of both social time as well as here are the school nuts and bolts time, this school doesn't happen. I mean, I think Rome was our worst one because of being in a country with a strong union where teachers by law cannot work in July or in August either. So they can't come in the country till September 1st and the school feels they're behind. So they're going to start September 4th. There's like no orientation time whatsoever. And that's partly based on the country's laws and unions. So like I said, I've seen all ends of the spectrum of everything in between about how schools do this. I felt that I've been okay this year, but I know some of my colleagues have been a bit stressed because they haven't been getting a lot of direct instruction about how to do this. And if you've not used PowerSchool and they're saying do this in PowerSchool, but they're not going to give you any PD sessions for it, you got to go get help from someone because you don't know what you're doing. So you got to carve out some of your own planning time to make this happen. So I think every school is a bit different. This current school is a little bit less on the direct help and you just got to go get it yourself when you know you need it. So if you're a good self-advocate, 
and you're self-aware of what you don't know, then it works. But no. if you're not, it's easy to kind of have the blinders on and all of a sudden, oh, you're supposed to do this last week and the midterm reports are due next week and you've done nothing. You're stressing now because you have a lot to do. And you're not sure how to do it. So that can be avoided through experience and being a good self-advocate, I think. Yes. Well, that self-orientation, we talk about that from time to time. I really appreciate your bringing up the technology, the portal, the LMS, whatever, the grading system. That's come up in some of our episodes to the point that even a person, if they've got choice in schools, might choose the school where they, oh, I like your technology systems more than the other ones. You know, it's probably down the list for most people, but that is huge. So I would add that uh, listeners, whether you're a veteran or a newbie, Definitely find out about those technology systems ahead of time. And just like Mark's saying, how will I get trained in doing that? Mark, you want to add to this? Yeah, I, I do, David. Um, and that's certainly been true for me, that I've been teaching a long time. I've taught in various school systems, in the French system in Gabon, and Chile, we had a modified system that involved the Chilean curriculum. I've taught AP, I've taught MYP, IB, and I personally don't like some of the features of MYP. So for the last couple of schools that I looked at, uh, if it was an MYP school, I was already turning away. Now, I'm MYP certified for math category one and two, so I've had my training. But there's just some things I don't like about some of the restrictions of the program. I think it's great on the high school end, but I think some things are a bit forced in the middle school end. So my preference is to not be in an MYP school. If the high school's IB starting grade 11, that's fine, as long as I can do what I think is appropriate in the middle school. And that's my current situation and was my last one also. So my last school in Jamaica was an IB school, but middle school was common core, make it work so the kids are ready for IB. Our current school is an AP school, but it's the same. Mm -hmm. So I have avoided the last two schools, full on MYP schools, because I don't like some of the features of the program. So I think that's very important. Besides the technology, also what is the curriculum doing? And is it somewhat modified and you have some leeway to do what as a professional you think might be good, but if it's going to be very restrictive, which I find MYP to be, and needlessly so in my opinion, there's a lot of schools out there that don't do MYP. They might do PYP and they do IB, but they don't do MYP for lots of reasons. And there's a lot of schools just like that. Let's do a modified version, Common Core, what we need to do in our school to get kids ready for advanced classes in grade 11, whether it's IB or AP. And that's the both that I'm on, right? I purposely have turned down some MYP schools for that reason. Excellent case in point. And just like you said, asking these questions, you've been offered a job, going deeper and finding out about that curriculum. And as you're saying, what is the flexibility that's being offered? And then the other side of it, what is the training that's going to be offered? So let's shift this to Audrey as a trailing spouse and more self-orientation. You're coming in you're going to get some connection to the community on some of the social outings, things like that, that happen. But what are ways to orientate yourself eh, to the school to, to a degree, but to the local culture and to the network of people to form your new friend group, for example? What do you say, Audrey? It is really different when you're not teaching at this school. Subbing helps a lot. And so I would recommend that for any trailing spouse that has that opportunity because then you do start to feel like you're part of it. For me, it's just about reaching out, again, advocating for yourself, trying to find those people. Mark helped me out this time, but in past schools, it's been just about making that effort and finding out when things are going on. And, you know, you've often talked about finding the fixers and connectors. I think for that, we rely on the returning teachers to find out who that is. It's so different in every situation, but find out who seems to be kind of the social organizer and get in contact with them and see what's going on and you know how you can meet people. And then again, it's just don't be shy. Ask, 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 because how are you going to find out if you don't ask? And don't just assume. And like Mark said, sometimes people come in and they feel a little overwhelmed. I think we have sometimes a bit of a mindset that asking for help makes you look weak. I have to disagree with that. I think asking for help is smart. I think it can be very helpful. I think it's a way to get to know more people. I don't really see anything wrong with asking for help. So please don't feel shy. 
And, you know, honestly, when I'm the person who does know the answer, I feel great when someone asks me if I can help them. That's just right up my alley is to be able to be of service to people. So please don't feel shy about asking. As for getting to know the local community, I really enjoy, you know, assuming that you're in a safe neighborhood, I enjoy walking around and chatting with shopkeepers or just getting to know my neighbors by being out there and by, like I said, try to learn a little bit of the local language so that you can at least make some inroads and make the effort. I do really appreciate schools that include the local staff at social gatherings, because otherwise, how are you going to meet them? How are you going to get to know them? And the last several schools we've been at have been like that, where if there's a staff party, it's a staff party. It's not a teacher party. And I really appreciate that. It's nice to have a broader variety of people that you can connect with. And one thing, again, I'll add just knowing you two and one of the big things that you all do is connect to athletics. And then that connects you to potentially parents of the kids, but also maybe even people outside the school. You all are very good at doing that in building community as well. Mark, anything you want to add on this? Yeah, I would just say also the one situation that sometimes the trailing spouses get into, like Audrey, that for Jamaica, because of waiting for paperwork, more for our dog than for her, but she arrived a month after me. So she missed all of the new teacher stuff that she could have been a part of, right? And so that made it hard for her to know people. So if we go to a staff adding or a happy hour or a school party, she didn't know anybody there. So this year, this new school was kind of critical for us that you've got to come when I do. And if we have no issues with you know, the tourist visa or our luggage or the dog or anything else, let's try to arrive together so that when they have the first, let's have a new teacher night. It's the welcome back to school party with the returning and new staff. She can be part of that. And she's right. A lot of schools do want to include trailing spouses, but you have to be in the country to be included. And so that was one of the drawbacks of Jamaica. She, Audrey often felt that she didn't know a lot of people because she missed both of the years where I was going back, she wasn't there for the beginning of the year activities, which tend to be more social. And that's not been the case this year. So she feels more connected with the people that are here. Huge point. Thanks for bringing that up. That's a good transition as we're talking about transitions into the loss and change that goes with these moves we make. I'm kind of laughing, Mark, at the beginning where you kept stating to people, oh, I'm retired. I remember when I heard you were retiring and I said, that's not going to last very long. So I guess that one, right? So let's talk a little bit as veterans, you've been through so many transitions to schools about just the emotional state of leaving people, leaving places behind, and then coming into the new place, but with more perspective on the feelings of loss and change. And Mark, we were going to go to you, but let's go back to Audrey to start us on this one. How did you prepare yourself? This You're a life coach. You've got a skill set now. What would you share with our audience on ways to prepare for these feelings that could be coming up? To me, the emotional side of the transition is so important. I think it's worth taking the time. I think it's worth being intentional. Mourn the loss of the place that you're leaving. Think about all the things that you have enjoyed there and what you're going to miss the most, lean into the feelings. The number of times that there's been the last day of school and typically I'm just going to be crying and, you know, really sad and giving people hugs and so on. And some people say, oh, I don't want to cry. That's of course your choice. I just think it's really important to let the feelings surround you and also to let people know how much you're going to miss them and leave well. I also typically try to spend extra time with the people that I most enjoyed spending time with and so have get-togethers and things. Once you've resigned and know that you're going to be leaving, start kind of planning it then, which nowadays is often kind of in October of the year that you're leaving. So I would say start early and get together often and just really intentionally focus on how much you're going to miss those people. Share out your contact info. 
you know, I'm the kind of person that would have multiple goodbye parties because I might have different groups of friends from different aspects of my life in a place. And I want to spend more time with each of them. And so I'd have multiple small parties, which people have teased me about, but that's what I like to do. And I highly recommend it. And then I think it's really important as well to start thinking about the place you're going to and what you're looking forward to there. And, you know, even when we were moving with the kids, I would go through a similar process with them and try to get them really thinking about what you're leaving, how you're feeling, and how you're feeling about the place you're going to. Thanks for bringing up about the children. You are at the stage, like you said, that they're not in play, but that's a huge other area to do some research and find out strategies to help them through that process. So thanks for sharing that, Audrey. How about you, Mark? We're a bit different on this, Audrey and I. I have always kind of looked at it in one way of, hey, we had a great time together. I'm sure our paths will cross again, so I'll say goodbye for now and I'll see you again. And that has played out numerous times for me. So I don't get emotional at all at the end of a school year. I don't cry. I don't get sad when I leave a place because I kind of assume uh, I'll see you again at some point. And often I have. We've had many colleagues we've seen many, many times over the years in various places and reconnected at different times. To me, it's kind of a part of this lifestyle that people come and go through your life and they're going to come and go through your life again. So when I leave a place, I'm, I'm never that sad. I just assume I'm going to see you again at some point. It may not happen, but I assume that it probably will. So that's one end. And on the family end, I mean, the reason that we kind of retired and left Jamaica in the first place was, okay, you know, our kids are getting to the adult age of 30 and 28. Our parents are all older. They're all in their late 80s and maybe we should be back home. And, you know, we were home for a year and realized that their life was their life and they want us to have our life. Especially my parents told me that directly that I said, you know, you didn't need me to come back to the house and move in with you and, and help you through the winter. And my mom said, no, <laughs> she said, no. You know, you want to be connected with family, but all the families are different. Aubrey's very, very close to her family. I'm not as close with mine. And my parents, even though they're older, really don't want me to live in the town with them. That's not what they want me to live my life and be happy for me, not worry about them in their late age. So everybody's a bit different. And you got to, I think, assess when you're looking at the emotional end of things, what's important to you and how do you value it and how does your family view things? If my parents said, we need you to be here. You know, I told him when I was in Vermont, hey, I can come to Connecticut and get a job in Connecticut. I'm getting emails all the time from schools that need a math teacher. I could get a job and work here and live with you guys, but they didn't want that. So I think you can't force it on people either. So you have to see what is your family situation? What is your connection with your family and what's going to make you feel comfortable? And as long as you're in your comfort zone, it's going to be okay. You are going to miss things overseas. Someone's going to pass away. Someone's going to have a graduation. Something's going to happen. You're going to miss some things, but that's part of the life because you're away for 10 months at a time. You have to be a bit reactionary when there's a birth of a child of a good friend. I mean, your own kids, you hope to be home for it, but you have to kind of accept what is your emotional state of what you want and what does your family want for you at the same time? So to me, there's a lot of two way with that. And that was kind of made more clear than ever to me this year that we were home when that's why I think we, yeah, I didn't think I was done teaching yet, but when I realized that, you know, I'm not done teaching, but I'm not done teaching overseas. I still like to do that. And my family kind of gave me the okay, more or less. But I will say on your point, when I said I was retiring, all my siblings and their spouses and everybody, the over under was Mark's going to be unretired with a new job before Christmas. And pretty much I was. So they were the same mindset that you were. This is not going to last. He's going to be out again before too long. So they kind of knew what you knew, I think. So definitely it's a theme of the show is it comes back to the individual and where they are. And then the topic right there, let's hit on that real quickly. And we're going to do a whole show with a panel on leaving international education. So we're going to really cover that one. What we're talking about here is communication. And in this case, communicating with your parents, doing self-reflection and knowing your circumstances. And one of the big lessons I think we all learned going all the way back to Saudi with family and distance and no internet back in those days, was that if you were to go back to your home country and if you weren't living down the street, people are busy. 
and you probably don't see them that much. And then when people started buying property like you all did to have a summer home for your children, people start coming to you. And that's what really works. So that's a tip I'll share for people who buy property back in their home country, a cabin or a house that they might rent out when they're not there. I think from our experience, that's the best way to stay connected to people and do that. All right. So as we're kind of wrapping up here, we're going to reveal where you two are. Let's hear how it's going and where you are. Audrey, where in the world are you two? Well, Mark is teaching at Lincoln School in Kathmandu, Nepal. Awesome. And what did you do just about a week or so ago, my friend? Yes, the hiking trip I was referring to earlier was to Annapurna Base Camp, and it was fabulous. It was gloriously beautiful. And just to be up in the fresh air and commune with nature and enjoy time with colleagues, you know, that's a good way to get to know some people as well as to take little trips out of town on the weekend or what have you. And it was fabulous. And boy, we're just really feeling blessed to be in this beautiful part of the world. Yes, I did that hike a long time ago, and it is beautiful. And it's pretty cool that you all went up towards the base camp. You really gained some elevation there. And so how is it going? You've been in Nepal now for a couple months. How's it going for you, Audrey? I'm really enjoying it. I'm finding that it's a lot more convenient to get things than I expected. We're in a great apartment in a good part of town. We have enough distance from the main road that our dog can enjoy a little bit of peace and quiet, but we're close enough that we can, like I say, I can be at the grocery store with a five minute walk, which is fabulous. And getting around is easy. And the school has been great in supporting us in a lot of different ways. So for me, it's been fabulous. Wonderful. And that is something that you've shared. It's been a, a good transition and you're comfortable in how things are going with the school and socially and setting up your new life. Mark, why don't we start for you with the school aspect of it and then outside of school and the personal take on how things are going. We chose the school really for one, because, you know, being welcomed to school and being recruited by a school, by a friend that knows me and knows what I can do was you already feel very welcome. You feel valued very much. And you always want to feel valued in your job. You don't want to feel scrutinized or someone's looking over your shoulder. They're not sure about you. You know, I was brought here for a reason by people that know me and want me to do things here. So that was a great situation to walk into for sure. And for us, you know, as a couple, we've looked at, well, let's look at our 40 year career for me of where we've been. And we've been in every region of the world. But Asia was only Southeast Asia, so we never had like Central Asia. So why don't we try that, you know, just for something different? It was also what's going to make us happy. And, you know, Audrey did miss the travel quite a bit. The unfortunate thing about Nepal, it is far from the U.S. You know, we're basically 10 hours ahead of East Coast U.S. And to get back is a 24 plus hour trip to get back. So I can't get back quickly. But I did do that for a weekend for my parents. And the thing is, when you've been teaching a long time, you can always say, well, I've done worse than this. <laughs> you know, so I did go home for a weekend once from Singapore, which was more than 30 hours each way just for a weekend to see my parents. So, you know, I've done things that are more extreme than we currently have. But it just seemed to fit a lot of our needs in terms of a region we haven't been, a school that's going to welcome us with open arms. They've gone out of their way to help us. I mean, I actually only requested a one-year contract, which is unusual because most of the contracts are two. And I said, if you want me, I'll give you one because I don't know about family, with our children, with our parents. I can only do one. And they agreed to that with the caveat of being, listen, we'd much rather have you do two. So can we get you to do two? But if you need to break it, there's no issue. There's no questions asked because you requested one. We're going to respect that. So again, I felt very welcome when they were meeting my needs of what's important to me. And important to me is have flexibility. If I really need to go home and be with my parents for next winter, I can do that and not be locked in. You know, And when you break a contract, it can be a very negative experience. And you might feel you're going to get blackballed or, you know, your name was on a certain list of people that break contracts. And I'm not worried about that now. This is most likely my last international job because we're at the end of the spectrum. But they assured me, no, 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 we want you here. We know you want one. We'd like you to do two. 
So we'll give you two because that's what we signed, but we'll break it on a, in a heartbeat if you need to. So that was very important to me to feel they were listening to what my needs are, that I want to come and join them, but I can't commit as I might've done. I mean, we worked together in Saudi. I was there 10 years and you know, the commitment I like to give to a school and I couldn't make that so much here just because of family dynamics have changed in the age that we're at now. So that was very important. One thing that was also important to me, I'll tell you a little sidebar story here. When I took the Jamaica job, I at the same time had an offer from a school in uh, Guatemala and they wanted me to come there. And they had me talk to some teachers there to convince me to come there. And they made the mistake of teachers that talked to me, didn't know this, but they were talking about how it's always nice and cool there. It's kind of like your Turner early spring. You got to wear a sweatshirt in your house. Like you, I'm a warm weather guy. <laughs> that turned me off right away. So right away, it's like, okay, thank you. I'm going to Jamaica where it's hot all the time, right? So when Nepal, that was one consideration that Italy was a bit cold for me in some ends. And certainly Chile was certainly cold because the opposite hemisphere school, we arrive in mid-July and that's the winter there. So you're arriving in winter. But Kathmandu, surprisingly, it's really a warmer climate than Rome even. You're in the valley and it's warm and it might get down to mid 30s or two, three degrees Celsius. It's not going to snow. You see the snow covered mountains from Kathmandu, but that's not what Kathmandu is going to have. So I like the warm weather. I enjoy that much more for quality of life. And I didn't want to be in a real cold place and I'm not. It's mid-October. I'm biking to school in shorts and a t-shirt and I will until November. Then I'll need a light jacket, right? So there are a lot of things that we're looking at what's going to be important to us. The work environment is very good. I, again, I chose a school that is middle school curriculum to get kids ready for high school, which you can have some flexibility to do what you want. Now, it's a smaller school, so I'm teaching grades six, seven, eight. I'm the only math teacher. I control the whole middle school. In fact, part of the recruiting for me was we want you to teach, but also, by the way, we want you to be our middle school coordinator, a new position we're creating. So that's actually been quite nice. So again, they gave me a lot of confidence and they gave me a lot of value and what, why they want me here. So to be able to do things the way I think they best should be done, you know, when you're a teacher and you've been teaching for a while, you start to figure out what you think helps the kids learn the best, what you think is important to them. And as a math teacher, I've never found a book that I like. A book is a resource. I want to create a lot of my own stuff and use what I think is most effective with the students. You know, they're allowing me to do that here. So that was important too. So going into a situation, if you're going to be locked into certain things you have to do, to me is very difficult, especially at my age of experience. If you're a brand new teacher, you're often very happy if they say, here's your book, here's your curriculum, teach this today and teach this tomorrow. And that helps you because you don't have that broad experience. But when you've been doing it for a while, you don't want that. You don't want someone to tell you what to do when you know that maybe this might be better. And so when I come in here and they have their at this program all set up and I say to them, well, I, I agree you're doing the right standards, but I don't like the sequence of how you're teaching it. I'm going to revise Atlas for what I'm teaching. And they say, okay, you're the expert. You like that very much. I mean, that makes your situation for working much better for you because they're not saying, no, you got to do this. And it's against what you believe to be the best way of learning for students, right? So there's been a lot of positives for us. The only <laughs> the real negative really is that, yeah, I do bike to school. Kathmandu, like you know in Vietnam, Kathmandu has lots of motorcycles, lots of scooters, crazy drivers do whatever they want. It is uh, taking your life in your hands sometimes, <laughs> commuting to school on a bicycle, but it's also exhilarating too, and it gives me the freedom that I want. But otherwise, we're in a very good situation, I think, for Audrey and for me to be able to do what we want and gain what we want from this. And I'm able to gain more experience and enjoy what I'm doing and impact students. And Audrey is able to meet new people and have some time to travel and entertain her parents and things like that and continue with her coaching. So I think it's been a very good fit for us. And we're very pleased with our choice of what we've decided to do. You share a lot of important information there for veterans. And one of the things for people just coming in, even if you're like in the middle of your career and a first timer, in a lot of cases, you've got to go with what the new school is going to offer you, unless you really are in a field that schools really need, like math or science or counselors. And then when you're at the end of the career, like you all are, you can really be choosy and have those critical conversations with the head of school on whether you're going to sign that contract. And what's jumping out at me where the two of you are in your lives and your careers and looking at positive psychology, 
Mark, just a couple of your character strengths to me are creativity and zest and the idea that you want to flourish in this new place. And you're not going to accept the idea that you're going to come in and tough parameters are going to be put on you and you're not going to be able to leverage your character strengths. I think this is a great case study for people maybe towards the end of their career to really be thoughtful, have, like I say, those critical conversations and make sure the fit, we talk so much about the fit, really is going to work and have agency for yourself. So often as educators, we don't want to step on toes. We don't want to make waves and we need to, it's not making waves to advocate for yourself. So I'm so glad that you've modeled that and that you two have made this going global jump one more time and who knows what's going to happen. And then for Audrey, that it's worked out so well that she can continue to be partnering with me on our podcast and work on her life coaching. Mark, anything else you want to add on this? Yeah, I'll just add that I think it's difficult when you're younger to find the best fit for yourself because there's other parameters. Maybe you're doing it because you don't have experience yet. You got to take this job to get experience. Maybe you got to take this job because it pays a bit more, not a great fit, but it pays more and you have bills and you have mortgages and loans or you have your young family. And sometimes you do have restrictions on, you got to kind of keep this, you got to choose this, you got to stay here because it's meeting these other needs, whether they're family or financial or whatever. And we're just very fortunate that we're at the other end of that, that we can look at less of those factors and more what do we want to do and make the impact that we think is important for us. And I I just look at a little thing today. We have like once a month where we match up our I'm a grade eight advisor. We match up our grade levels with some of the elementary for a little social activity, right? And so my grade eights are with the grade threes and they were writing some little stories. They wanted us to come in, listen to the stories and give them feedback. And there's 20 grade eights and 30 grade threes. And so they were going to be groups of three. I was going to pair my kids up. And I had two of my grade eight students come to see me yesterday and say, have you made the pairs yet? I said, well, I'm going to be matching people up. And they said, if you could, Mr. Forge, we each have a crush on these two boys. Could you pair us with these two boys? <laughs> and just the fact that they feel comfortable enough to come to see me to ask me that. And I said, sure, that probably can work. And then they emailed me that night to make sure I was going to do it for them. <laughs> I thought it was just kind of phenomenal that they, yeah, okay, it's about school, but they have other issues too. And they're willing to share that with me. I just thought that was the funniest thing and the most impressive thing and the cutest thing all at once, you know, that that kind of thing happens. So that's kind of why when I realized I wasn't ready to be retired, it's stuff like that, you know? And so this school has already enabled me to do that where I think I'm already making a big enough impact on kids that I have kind of that relationship with some of the kids already, which I think is great. So we're at a point now that we know that I don't need to teach. I could stay retired, but I'd like to. Let's find something that's going to make me happy and work for Audrey as well as a couple overseas. And we think we found that. And so we know that we're very fortunate, but we also that that situation comes with putting in time and experience. And I guess the best advice I can give to someone younger is, Always do your best to commit to the school you're in. If you can coach, if you can go to every school music performance and every school event so the kids see you outside of school, always make sure you're early for school and not pushing the the late button in and stay late and be involved in things so that the school sees that you commit to them. Because then when you get your next job, people hear about you. They know that you're that kind of teacher that commits so much. And so you start getting better situations and better jobs where you do want to stay because the school is a really good school and they value you. So really, that's the best advice I can give to a young teacher of just do your best to commit and be your best professional so that you get in a situation where later on in your career, people are asking you to come to them because they know about you. And that's the ideal situation. But it takes time to create that situation. Thanks for that added tip. That is huge. Making that commitment. And one of the greatest benefits as we were talking off mic is just as you said, how you've bonded with your students. And we've talked about Audrey and I when leaving international education and that identity and that connection with the students, it's a very tough break. So I'm glad you're back in the game, my friend. All right. Shifting over to Audrey as we wrap up. Audrey, what is a way or two that people can follow the two of you? I know you're on LinkedIn. Mark, I don't think you're so active on the social networking, but if people wanted to reach out to you, how can people connect 
with you and Mark. Well, they can always email me at educatorsgoingglobal at gmail.com. Yeah. <laughs> and also, as you said, I'm active on LinkedIn, so please reach out to me there. All right, folks. I was just saying to Audrey, she was editing an episode the other day on how densely packed that interview was with so much helpful information. I think we've done it again. I really appreciate, and I'm sure our audience does, the tips, the strategies, the experiences, the insights that you two pulled together for us for this show. So thank you. Audrey and Mark Forgeron for being on the Educators Going Global podcast. Woohoo! Thanks for having us. Thank you, David. Always good to reconnect. Looking forward to see you again sometime now that we're both back in an area that we hope to cross paths again at some point. So it'll be good to see you. Enjoy your work and keep up the information avenue that you're providing for people that are both new teachers and veterans. There's always things they can think about. And for me, I guess my main thing is when you think you're out of the game, maybe you're not. Think about it carefully. And if you start missing it, get back in the game. Right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's Audrey. And David. We're so happy and grateful that you're here listening to us. We really want to thank the people who follow us on Apple Podcasts and have written reviews. We appreciate you guys. We hope to increase our reach within the international education community, so we are asking for your help. Please follow our show on Apple, Spotify, YouTube Music, or your favorite podcast listening app. We have posted instructions on how to do this on our podcast page. If you like our show and the services we aim to provide, please rate us and write a review. This will help us grow our audience and support our mission of sharing the joys of international teaching with as broad a group as possible. We'd love to increase those numbers in Africa, South America, and Australia. So thanks again for listening and for all your support. Let's recruit as many teaching peeps as possible to travel, teach, and connect with us.